5.01 p.m. And I am noting that Commissioner Fisher has been appointed to this committee. The information will be updated to reflect the appointment of Commissioner Fisher. And we have our general information listed um, under agenda A around accessibility and virtual meeting information. Our opening items, the land acknowledgement. We, the San Francisco Board of Education, acknowledge that we are on unceded ancestral homeland of the Romata Shaloni, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula, as the indigenous stewards of this land, and in accordance with traditions, the Ramatosh Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatosh community and by affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. Now I'd like to move to the approval of board minutes, the Ad Hoc Committee on Fiscal and Operational Health of August 7th, 2024. Do you have a second? Or so moved. Second. All right. Um, and I will, for roll call. Or by consent, I guess. Yes. 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 We also have the approval of committee summary memos from August 7th, uh, 2024. I'm sorry, I should have moved those together. Can I get another motion, please? So moved. Second. Yes. Commissioner Fisher? Yes. Commissioner Weissman White? Yes. Vice President Weissman. Thank you so much. And at this time, we will hold public comment on agenda items. We will now take public comment on our discussion item on F SFUSD's fiscal and operational health. Um, we are only speaking to the item on the agenda. Please open public comment. If there are any members of the public, if you have uh, any public comment related to any item on the agenda, please um, come up to the podium. I don't have any cards, so there are no in-person in public comment. I will move on to our virtual participants. Uh, we will take public comment. Again, this will be on agenda items only. Each speaker will have one minute. Please raise your hand if you care to speak to any of the items on the agenda. Okay. Seeing one hand raise. Aaron, go ahead, please. Two minutes, please. Yes. yes. Hello. Um, Hello. Um, I'm wanting to speak regarding the dashboard that was shared for this committee and seeing um, around the school closures, knowing that that is coming up, that date is coming up soon when we might hear which schools will be closed. Um, I didn't see a lot of details in terms of a transition plan. Um, I know a lot of families and community members and people across the nation are paying attention to this Senate, I mean, to this city and what we are doing and wanting to just make sure that when parents and school staff hear that their school is closed, they know what the transition plan will be so that their fears will be alleviated. Thank you. Thank you. That does conclude virtual public comment. Thank you. I will now close public comment on agenda items. Uh, tonight, I want to welcome everyone to the sixth meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee on Fiscal and Operational Health. Our committee has four goals. One is to monitor the superintendent's plans and um, progress towards achieving fiscal and operational health. Second, make recommendations to improve the board's ability to carry out its fiscal and operational governance responsibilities. Third, make recommendations to improve how the board oversees and evaluates the superintendent's management 
of the district, and fourth, ensure the full board understands the district's financial and operational status and associated risks. Um, I want to, again, make the announcement that Commissioner Fisher has joined the committee. I'm happy to announce that Commissioner Fisher has joined um, our committee. She is taking the place of former board president, Matamidi, um, who recently resigned from the board. So thank you, Commissioner Fisher, for joining us um, for this important work. I look forward to being part of the work and working alongside you. Thank you. I um, also want to uh, announce how to find the dashboard online, and we're happy to share that all committee materials on SFUSD's website. Uh, simply go to our homepage, then uh, board of, click to the Board of Education, then Committees, and on the website, you'll find information about the committee, including how to get in touch with us, an easy to read um, and updated dashboard, the summary memos from each committee meeting, and links to video recordings uh, from each meeting. And I'd like to introduce um, the dashboard. Uh, the committee's main deliverable is to um, produce and use a fiscal and operational health dashboard. And the dashboard's purpose is to give the, the, the committee, the full board, and the public increased transparency into the superintendent's progress towards key fiscal and operation, um, operational actions and milestones. And at our August 7th committee meeting, this committee and staff agreed upon the dashboard's contents. And I want to thank in advance um, to Dr. Huntoon and Dr. Wayne, uh, Superintendent Wayne, for their commitment in working with the board on updating the status of the dashboard and the um, ongoing reporting uh, through this committee. And during that each committee meeting, we will review the dashboard together to ensure that committee members are aware of each item's status, risk, and corrective actions, receive the fiscal advisor's um, assessments of progress and risk, discuss acceptable degrees of risk and whether corrective measures are sufficient, and ensure the public sees the progress that's being made uh, towards fiscal and operational uh, priorities. And today is the first meeting where staff will share the progress of uh, each item at, at a high, high level, as well as followed up by some discussion by committee members. And this is a new process, and we're going to learn as we go and probably make some mistakes along the way, um, and at the same time be able to collaborate and recognize um, the shared learning and the uh, full commitment uh, to doing this learning together between as a governance team, between the board, as well as with Superintendent Wayne and, um, and Dr. Huntoon and staff. So again, we're very thankful for Dr. Huntoon's partnership and leadership, and she's jumped right into uh, the deep ocean here at SFUSD, and um, she's just very thankful for her being part of the team. And so with that, um, the dashboard discussion, um, today's agenda is simple and clear, and that we hope to lead to some robust discussions. Also, I'll um, turn it over to Superintendent Wayne if you have any opening uh, remarks as well. Uh, yeah, thank you, Commissioner Lamb, and uh, welcome commissioners and members of the public. Um, and appreciate the, the detailed overview. And as you shared, um, tonight's focus is on the um, our uh, fiscal and operational health dashboard. And just to be more specific too, at the last meeting, we shared more the dashboard concept with what was in it, but it hadn't yet had all the due dates, the owners and deliverables. And, and if this committee is really going to provide the level of oversight and accountability to which you refer, we recognize that it, that needed to be, that needs to be completed. And so then you could see how we're doing in each area. So really tonight is more of a line by line of each um, uh, area because we have now completed those, um, uh, you know, uh, completed the, the dashboard to name, you know, who owns what and by when we're doing it. And then this can be an opportunity for you to ask for clarification on the different tasks, um, as well as, you know, what happens if we, if we do, um, aren't on target. And I think uh, Dr. Huntoon is going to speak to a future desire to have it, um, you know, start to have on the dashboard indications of uh, green, yellow, red, like we're, we have on our ERP, um, the Enterprise Resource Planning uh, Dashboard. And so um, we'll, we'll talk to, through that as well. Um, but since the first 
um, area is budget monitoring and planning. I'll turn it over to Dr. Huntoon to uh, just walk us through what's been established since the last committee meeting. Oh, and two things then as we start, just we do have our new commissioner, Phil Kim. So commissioners are invited to be um, on the dais to, to listen, but he's not part of the, the team, um, of the committee rather, he's not part of the team. Uh, and then also we have online um, Mr. Dushan and Ms. Lazan, as well as uh, Dr. Candy Clark, who's you know, still leading our ERP implementation, uh, available be, uh, for questions and comments uh, as we go through this. All right. Good evening. Thank you. Um, good evening, commissioners, um, Superintendent Wayne. And so, yes, I've, I've jumped right into the ocean with the rest of my colleagues, and I'm, I, am, I am happy to be here, and it's a lot of hard work, but good work. Um, so this evening, as you've indicated, we're going to go over the dashboard. We are going to go line by line. Um, we have tried to populate it as much as possible based on what we know at this point in time, and as you've indicated, it is a new it's a new document, it's a new process. And so as we move along, we will um, make adjustments as necessary. So I'm gonna start out with section number one, budget monitoring and planning. Um, and the first two items, 1.1 and 1.2, those have been completed. And oh, is somebody going to be showing? Okay, perfect. Um, so if you um, scroll across to the right, you will actually see that in column L is where the status shows up. And so um, we have completed under 1.1 and 1.2. You will see that those items have been identified as completed. Those timeframes have, have passed and we did complete those items. One was the adopted budget, which occurred in June of 2024. And the other one was the 45 day revision, which did not apply this year. Um, I also want to uh, want to indicate as we go through this, you will see that the majority of them are not started as we move down down into some other areas, um, and the, you will see that they're on schedule. But note that as we come back to provide the updates, that could change. It could change to a yellow, which means we're slightly behind, or we are behind, and you will see that in red. Um, and so just to know that those things can change from one reporting period to another. Dr. Huntoon, I just oh, yes. want to also note, um, I know that um, for the public, there are many details to this dashboard. Yes. It is also part of the ongoing work of the staff, and I think that is why there's that collaboration um, around recognition that this isn't hopefully additional work, but work that makes sense to working towards the goal um, that we're all working towards. So happy to, if you want to give highlights from the various areas, if you want to, um, I think committee members are certainly um, very interested in learning about where major progress has been made, which you've already started to speak to, but um, as well as some major upcoming milestones and potential risk. Um, just knowing that the, is, things are so dynamic right now um, and needing to meet some, um, you know, both mid short term and midterm milestones, benchmarks in order to get us to um, ultimately meeting those deadlines. Thank you for that. Yes. So moving on into um, 1.3, this is something that will come up with more detail on the September 25th meeting. Um, and you will note that uh, where staff is working on the development of the core versus non-core. And I will say um, for myself in particular, getting a better understanding of what that means here in San Francisco. Um, it can take different meanings from one agency to another. So that is on schedule um, for the September 25th meeting that we'll be bringing something back. Um, so in 1.4, this is the overview of the first interim report that will not come to the board until it's due on or before December 15th. So that is on schedule at this point in time. And you will see that coming um, first to the, the fiscal stabilization committee and then onto the board in December. And so you will see um, that notation on 1.4, which is, is line 13, you will see that it is on schedule. You will see that there are many notes that have been added into those areas as well. 
1.5, uh, this is the board action that will come for the first interim. Again, I believe it looks like the December 10th meeting is when uh, the board will see the first interim. And then the this next uh, 1.6 and 1.7, this is for um, the second interim report. Again, another statutory report. You will not see that until March. And it is as of J January 31st, that basically shows your budget as well as your, your actuals for that period of time. As we move. Dr. Um, Huntoon, just oh, for yes. process um, yep. for my colleagues, I'm sorry, I did not uh, state this before. Let's go by se section by section. And if it's okay with you, Dr. Huntoon, we'll take questions that way. Perfect. Great. That way we don't get too far ahead um, without um, for my colleagues. So at this time, Colleagues, do you have any questions related to section one, the budget monitoring and planning? Go ahead, Vice President Weissman Ward. Thank you. And it's nice to see the nice updates see. happening. And it's nice to see both and yeah, jumped into the deep end of the ocean. But good thing we've been told you're a masterful swimmer. Oh. <laughs> so um, I have. Um, two general questions that if I ask now, I think I probably won't have to ask later. So there's two items, um, uh, one line, um, item 1.5 and 1.8 that you just talked about that haven't been started. Um, they do have 2024 deadlines. So I'm just wondering, when do you anticipate needing to begin this work in order to meet that deadline? Um, and um, I guess related to that, how, and maybe just more globally, but let me let me ask that question first and then I'll ask the second one, which is a different question. So one, on 1. 1.5 and 1.8? That's right. Okay. So 1.5, this is the first interim report. It, it is, I'm sorry, I was leaning back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so the first interim report is <sighs> as of October 31st. So your, that's going to be for your budget as of that point in time and also your actuals as of that point in time. So the transactions that have come in for revenues and your transactions for expenditures. So there's some minimal work that can start before that time, but very little. It really ramps up very quickly after October 31st and that after all of those transactions are posted so that um, staff can prepare the necessary reports that will come okay, that will come before the board in December. One thing I want to add on though is what here's what will be different about this first interim and um, maybe maybe this uh, it, it's just mentioned here um, as, a, as a note maybe in the description of the deliverable be added. This is the first place when we say revisions to the fiscal stabilization plan this is the first place where they'll publicly show up. So that is being worked on even now, even a little prior to the, the actual. So what, so as you recall, we submitted uh, per CDE requirement with our budget, a specific reduction plan for 25, 26. This had over 500 FTEs listed on it. Um, this was necessary so they could see that we understood what needed to be done to uh, achieve a balanced budget. It was also recognized that in you know uh, June of 2024, in June of 2024, we may not know all uh, like there may need to be adjustments made to what we identify there. So, for example, none of the reductions from um, we submitted in June of 2024 were any you know, were specifically related to the school closure process. By December, we'll have identified savings from the school closure process that would be named, and then the the, the 505 would be updated uh, accordingly. So that is happening. Like so, even before we finish the first interim, we're in the process now of starting to uh, think through that reconciliation, and it's related to. I don't know if this comes as in the later dashboard item, but the what's uh, you know what's core versus non-core because that's how we start aligning our expenditures to that so that is happening now um, as well too and that will be a little different than a typical first interim report when we'll have the first pass of those adjustments for 25 26 um, uh, back in december yeah and i and the addition that i would make to that is 
Um, the year has not closed for 23-24, so that will be taken into consideration, as well as the start of the 24-25 year and any reductions in expenditures that we've been able, been able to capture. Thanks. And, um, and then 1.8, you also had a question on that. Yes. Okay. Um, so the 25-26 budget calendar um, will be developed and will come before, I think we have that in December, um, because that's really where we start looking at the 25-26. But as we look at our fiscal stabilization plan, that will be kind of coming together, compiling with the first interim. Um, you will see us already starting to work on 25-26, but we'll mirror those actions and, and activities that will occur for budget calendar in December. Thanks. And yeah, I think similarly, the question, you know, when, when do you anticipate needing to begin or beginning in earnest? And the response to 1.5, thank you for reminding me that that makes total sense. And I don't know if it's useful to the public or useful to my colleagues. And I, I know there's already so much information in here, but we're going to, we may not, we may, you may leave it as not started for quite like for at least two more months, perhaps. I'm going to, I'm taking my own notes, so I don't have to ask again next time, but I don't know if it makes sense when you know that something can't be begun in earnest because of, for example, it's after October 31st that it, what you need exists. I appreciate Dr. Wayne's additional information shared, but I don't, if it, if you think it's appropriate in the um, notes section to just have okay. That might be useful so that we're not like, what, why haven't you started it yet when there's thank a you. legitimate that's, that's reason good. that you haven't. Valid point. Thank you. Um, and then my other question, um, sort of generally, well, maybe I'll save this for the end because it's about prioritizing if we get behind. Dr. Hontin, also um, for sections two through seven, um, let's spend you know a couple minutes for each section for you to, again, give us the major, major areas of progress um, and those risks, and then that way we can open it up for questions in that way. And, and I, my colleague here with me this evening, Ms. Amy Baer, um, she's going to go over section two. Great, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, so the first two uh, areas in section two, 2.1 and 2.2, are underway. Um, the first one is uh, Dr. Hantoon and I have met with a provider that offers the early retirement programs. Um, this is called a special early retirement program, um, but it really is for people who have reached retirement age and are able to retire, provides them a financial incentive to do so. So we uh, met with the company and are in the process of providing our employee data to them right now. They'll analyze our employee data looking at things like age, years of service, uh, expected life expectancy, uh, and they will come back to the district with a proposal to say how much each group could be offered as a retirement incentive. Uh, and so we anticipate bringing that to the board at the second meeting in September. And then the second item is 2.2 um, .2 is um, it should really be titled the seniority list because this is the backbone of all of the activities that lead up in section two. Um, if the district decides to um, do any reduction in force or any layoffs. So that's happening right now in HR. It's an annual task that the seniority list is updated with people who resign, retire, leave the district for any reason. And all of the new hires are updated. All of the status changes take place if people move from probationary to permanent, for example. If people earn a different credential, then that needs to be updated as well. So that work is underway right now, and we anticipate sending out the draft seniority list to staff to verify and approve in October as scheduled. So those are the highlights of section two, if there are any questions. Commissioner Fisher. Thank you. I know this is a lot of work, so thank you so much for everything you're doing here. Um, one of the issues that's been pointed out by Mr. Rosenfeld and his work with us is our over-reliance on contractors and consultants. Um, I'm not sure if that fits into section two or not, but that's one of my overarching questions is, you know, where, um, where is that reflected and monitored in the dashboard? I don't know that that's relevant to section two. I mean, section two is really about 
getting the our staff employee list um, correct for in the event that we do layoffs. Can you say more about your question about contractors? I can hold it for later. Okay. Maybe it would be another section. So my other, I think my second question might follow then into the same bucket because I appreciate all the work we're doing around layoff planning. Uh, to me, and, and maybe this is just when it says HR and layoff planning, I assume that it's more than layoff planning. Maybe I'm just not understanding the way the dashboard is laid out. But um, I think really my one of my other questions, though, that we're seeing this year is where where in the dashboard are we monitoring and addressing our key vacancies? You know, we're seeing a lot of SPED vacancies, for example, right now. And these key functions are in places where not having the staff puts us at significant risk, either safety risk to students, you know, lack of educational attainment, lawsuits, it opens us to lawsuits for not meeting our compliance mandates. Where would that be appropriate to monitor in the dashboard? Where is it being monitored or where should it be if it's not? Um, I'm, I'm going to jump. Um, good. Uh, appreciate the question. So first, with I think for the contracts, I think that would be maybe in other deficiencies, and I understand what you're saying, and I, I, so it might be an area um, to add. You heard me share at the board meeting, and again, in part in response to um, uh, questions, questions you, you and, and Commissioner Matamidi had. Um, wait, is that okay? Yeah, uh, you know we've we've updated at least both how contracts are coming forward with the contract abstract as well as how we're monitoring it but you're asking then okay so what do we do with that now like now the inf information is more transparent how are we making sure we're following best practices and not over relying on contracts right and so like even in this section i mean where you know like we're working with keener because there is a specialized knowledge base around doing early retirement they do it with a lot of districts or for the seniority list we're working with f3 to make sure that it could the, our seniority list is defensible within a when if layoffs get questioned by the administrative law judge. So that's number one. So I think contracts has a place um, uh, in maybe six. To your second point, just want to share. I don't know if it's HR and layoffs, but I do think it is specific to layoff planning because that was one of the that's major right. reasons we got yes. they downgraded us from qualified to negative because even though we didn't end up doing certificated layoffs for 25, 20, 24, 25. We did do some uh, classified layoffs, but even though we didn't do certificated layoffs, their assessment at the time was that if we had tried to do uh, certificated layoffs, they wouldn't have been successful. And so again, that said that it made them say like, really, we, we see this as a much greater risk than the district is recognizing and thus we were, we're moving you to negative. And so, that's why this is really around specifically layoff planning. Um, so again, doesn't need to say HR layoff planning, but that that was a big, big focus of uh, CDE's review. Then to your third point, I mean, for our operational health, we need to not have we need to not have so many vacancies and like want to start off. I don't. Um, yeah, I'm not sure where that falls in in here but part of this if we do all of this better and we're going to talk about this at, at, on september 10th yeah september 10th when we go over guardrail 4.1 that might be where the conversation happens actually yeah maybe maybe let's save that conversation for september 10th and then see if it needs to be incorporated in the ad hoc thank you and before we move into section three i wanted to give a chance to our fiscal advisors um i let sean and pam lazan if they want to note for um as they're working with staff, also uh, where they see um, the biggest risks in section one and two, as long with progress, if they would like to note. Can I also ask if they have any <laughs> feedback on my questions to provide them as well? Yeah. So I don't know if uh, Mr. Dushan and Ms. Lazan, there they are. Right, unsuccessfully to unmute. Um, I'll, I'll take a stab at a couple of them. The contracts issue, um, <clears throat> are, there are some big contracts and a lot of contract employees, not employees, but contractors 
working on functions that are at this point deemed temporary, like transition of the ERP. Uh, there is a plan with the group that's working with that to phase those out and um, decrease the reliance on those. In terms of the SPED positions that are vacant, those are a critical issue. They also are a complex issue because SPED classes aren't as easy to count as regular ed, gen ed classes, and some of them are even intertwined with um, duplicate two teachers in a classroom. Our position on SPED and any position, any other open position is before we even consider whether it should be OPE should be approved, it needs to be budgeted. So we're staff is working very much on what the budget status is of those open positions. So they're progressing, I think, as fast as they possibly can. We are with them. And I think there was a third question in terms of um, what did I miss? Pam can fill it if she, if she, she heard what I missed. Or you could repeat it, um, Commissioner Lee. I appreciate those clarifications. I think that um, when I talk about an over-reliance on contractors and consultants, um, I know we do have some short-term and temporary knowledge base we need to bring in, but we also do have a lot of knowledge holes that are material to the work we do as a district that instead of hiring staff, we plug with contractors. Um, including special education, instead of bringing in the registered behavior technicians that are written into IEPs, we contract out at, you know, so that's one example. But so I think this is a yes and. I think yes, some of it is temporary, some of it is makes sense to do from a contract perspective, and some of it, it really makes sense for us to bring the appropriate expertise in house, like you, Dr. Huntoon, right? So uh, my question to clarify is really, where have we where do we do that research to take a look at the contracts and see what should be in house, what is short term and appropriate to be a, a con, you know, that's, I think, what I haven't teased out is where that should be monitored on the dashboard and our overall fiscal health. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start and then others can join in. Um, I would say, you know, particularly with special ed, this is an area that um, is very difficult for hiring staff, not just in San Francisco, but across the state and more than likely across the nation. Um, and so we would rather have employees as opposed to contracting out. Um, I will tell you that as part of our practices and procedures going forward, we are really looking at contracts. We're looking at the types of contracts. Uh, in different different divisions, different disciplines, DOT, um, you know, what's happening at our sites, what's happening at the district office, um, also what's happening in our bond department, because we do have contracts for different purposes. But particularly as you are talking about special ed, that is an area that oftentimes it is short because of the specialization um, of the positions that are needed, um, but not that we would want them to be ongoing. Um, because we do continue to monitor that throughout the year. And when those positions are, they are open and then they are filled, then those contracts are, are reduced. So I don't know if there's anybody else wants to speak to that. And Commissioner Fish, I just also want to note that um, the SPED audit is also a key piece of what was coming out of the FIGMA. And I want to thank Dr. Aguilar Ford has been um, is working um, on that audit as well. So I think that is going to be the place where we're going to see the intersections around the staffing needs um, and the monitoring there. So if we will certainly note that uh, for board leadership to ensure that there is um, clear monitoring from the board. And that begins at the end of October. Thank you. Yes. Well, and Mr. Rosenfeld, I think his notation of us <coughs> relying on contractors wasn't specific to SPED. It. That's my wheelhouse. That's what I understand. So that's why I use that example. But I, the, if, so to, you know, Chair Lamb, I've noted, and so I won't keep going with this, but just overall, where are we, where are we ending our reliance on contractors when we can? No, that, no, I, just to, to uh, speak to a, a bright spot, 
I mean, you're right. It's not just in special education. Um, one area has been in custodial work. I remember there was one that was brought forward last year, but this year we started, um, we worked with uh, the city and really um, HR prioritized making sure that we can move forward on hiring, um, not to get too technical, I don't even know the terms, but techs from PECs, or the, from temporary to permanent. And we started this year with custodial um, staff at the, at the level we needed to open schools and provide the support and not needing to um, bring in contractors. So that was, uh, that was a, a very good bright spot because um, Ms. Poily, who does the, uh, is in charge of facilities, said this is the first time in her five years here that we've actually started with the appropriate level of custodial support. So yes, it's in a lot of areas, but we're, that's one where we improved. Dr. Huntington, I think you've, you've heard for years now um, that the board had wanted the contractor and overall um, understanding, as you mentioned, of all the different layers from departments centrally to at the site levels to um, understanding kind of the overall landscape. Um, do you have a sense there of your recommendation given this committee is is certainly focused in on the dashboard and the fiscal and operational health where you see um, where potentially that around the monitoring and, and time frame. So um, having a process that we are centralizing contracts so that they're coming through procurement um, and so then they come to the board in a process that um, the eyes are on those contracts and questions can be asked early on. Vice President Weissman Ward. Thank you. I had one very small clarifying question. Um, Dr. Bear, for um, item 2.2, you had indicated that this work is underway. I just want to flag that the dashboard says not started. So maybe that just is wasn't updated, but I'm happy to hear it's been started. Yeah, we talked about that today and d debated on what to indicate actually because we haven't sent it out to employees yet to verify so we're getting it ready to do that so however you think it should be reflected that it, that's work that HR does all throughout the year but the task of sending it out in October has not yet been done I see yeah the description is um, that yes you will send it and it's notice I see so the work happens and then and then we send it out for okay. review for by employees okay thanks but I think you're, well, you're two for two on bringing up the theme that maybe there's not quite enough nuance. We don't want it too complicated, but maybe there needs to be another something between not started and ongoing. Or uh, So we'll see how the next four sections go. Maybe we'll add that for the next time. Okay, well, moved into section three, position monitoring and control. So I'll continue with that one. So um, the hiring freeze was put in process, I believe, in May. Um, Dr. Wayne can, can correct me if that's wrong. Um, but um, that, uh, so that process has, has already been put in place initially um, and is continuing to be monitored. And in some cases, we are talking with our friends at CDE on a regular basis, almost daily. Um, and then um, making sure that we have an interim, interim position control process until we can transition to frontline, uh, which we have some of our modules that will start as early as January of 2025 with budget development. And that will be, and we're already looking at our data crossing over into frontline uh, with account codes and our position control because that will need to be put in place in order for us to do our budget development. And so that will, again, be all incorporated into that. So and that we are looking forward to. Um, and then our go live, uh, depending on what the module is for ER, our ERP system, I mentioned budget development in January. We will have procurement that will come on in April, and then all of the other um, modules for um, finance, payroll, and the like will come on in July of 2025. Um, and please note that there is some parallel work that will happen um, before we get to those points in time so that we know, number one, that the data is in there uh, in a manner that it should, but particularly for payroll that we're running parallel payrolls um, for those months ahead of going live. And that does require both HR and business staff to enter that, to, to double enter data. Okay. 
The one, la one last item that I will mention on um, section three has to do with the establishment of an inter internal control function. Um, and that is a position that um, job description has been drafted um, and has been reviewed by CDE. It will next go to executive cabinet um, after it first goes to our friends in HR to get the formatting correct. Um, and then it will go to executive cabinet before it comes on to the board for approval. Our, our um, target date is for October for that to come to the board. That's great. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to see that progress. I do want to um, kind of hone in our conversation. Um, certainly, we want to highlight the progress, but really start to get an understanding around the risk. Um, and so we'd like to ask uh, Dr. Huntoon for this particular section, we know that position monitoring control has been one of the biggest Achilles heel, so to speak, for the district um, that we've seen over the last couple of years. Um, certainly that has been time and time again lifted. Um, it's been documented um, through our fiscal advisors. Um, can you give us um, just directly, you know, what's the biggest risk in this area at this time? So uh, for position control, yeah, uh, um, and that is going to be literally having a, a single integrated system. That really is the issue. Um, because we, we are um, decentralized and we do not have a single system that basically feeds from, you know, all modules working together and you're not, you know, entering and using different Excel spreadsheets. So that's really where that risk is coming. Anytime that you have um, an increase um, manual entering, that's going to increase your, increase your risk. Um, so I'm hearing that the on-time uh, ERP system implementation going live with um, the all the things that go into testing um, is and we'll go into that section number four is something that is going to be imperative in order to have the position monitoring and control that that will have to be um, that's a critical pathway right now i'd like to I, i'd like to um also speak to the risk in a different way and then <laughs> ask um uh maybe elliot to chime in on this right when when mike fine shared with us the ficmat report and he talked about uh, position control is a three-legged stool and it's understanding you know what's in the budget what um, what's uh, the staffing levels the, the what's in our HR system and then verifying that at the schools we are now in the process of doing that so the actual risk we're facing now is what you all are hearing from our community that we are not moving on positions that they're expecting filled or that need to be filled quick quickly that's because we are now not moving forward until those uh, legs of the stools have been verified in each case. So we do have a position control process now, um, you know, kind of cobbled together that's in, in place that's slow and burdensome for the reason Dr. Huntoon is saying, is that we, we never had a system set up where the, all the information was in one place and then verified before moving forward. So like when we're talking about special education, the, the previous practice had been, let's move forward with hiring or approving the NPAs until, and we'll figure out the budget afterwards and, and where the position controls number is going. That's not good position control. It, uh, so now we're following good position control, but it is meaning that, that we're you know, not moving forward until there's a PCN, which brings a different risk, which we've highlighted and was highlighted at the last board meeting that now students are, getting, are not getting legally required services if, you know, we haven't filled the position and we don't have a backup plan in, in place. So I know you're, the risk for, um, for the financial operational health is one piece I think the, um, Dr. Huntoon answered well, but, we're, but I would say we, are, we do have a process cobbled together in place now, but then the risk of, in other areas is that exacerbated until we get a good one in place. I don't know, I have, I'd be curious to hear, um, I just want to hear Elliot's assessment of that as well. Yep. You pretty much explained it. And we've been dealing with this risk factor for a long, long time. And it really became obvious the first time we started reviewing open positions. So um, Sven Irvin, who's on your staff, 
has done an incredible job of taking what's in Empower, pulling it out, and then we essentially go through every open position to find out, A, is it really open? Is it funded? Is it needed? So taking a, a little bit further on your example of SPED, Dr. Wayne, you should be able to not quite just push a button, but you should be able to get a roster of classes and who's teaching those classes, actually starting with position control. You should just, you know, who are the people that are teaching SPED? Since we cannot do that, and it's not clear who is teaching where because it's not in a good system and where they're funded, it becomes problematic. And as much as those, those classes need to be need to be filled, they do not need to be double filled when you're in the budget predicament that you are. Everything you add to the budget that doesn't that doesn't need to be there because you can't tell whether it's there I mean, just becomes confusing and aggravates the whole budget issue. So there is a risk both fiscal and staffing wise. And that's why we are expediting, but being careful as we move forward. So I don't know if that amplifies it, confuses it. She pretty much explained it, Dr. Wayne. No, that's helpful. So uh, as I'm hearing in summary that one of the biggest risks until we have that ERP online is that um, the process is cobbled together. We have kind of a, a process right now um, with you know the review and approval of our CDE advisors, but certainly that provides potential risk around adding to the budget if we're not clear about its funding source, how many um, staff are needed and necessary. Is that an accurate summary, Dr. Huntoon? One of my challenges with this has always been chicken and egg, right? We we don't have the position control to know what we have versus what we don't have. So how are we monitoring the resources that are necessary to fully implement this along with all the other priorities that we're trying to implement at exactly the same time? I'm not sure where I see that in the dashboard and what in the work we're doing. I would say that it's embedded. It's embedded in these, these different tasks that we're going through. If it's um, first interim, um, whether it's second interim, the adopted budget, but we are monitoring it through the different resources that are going to support that, um, going through the process to determine as best we can with enrollment um, that's at the sites by doing warm body counts or people counts, as my friend over here um, would say, um, at the beginning of the year um, to determine where those vacancies really are. But what is supporting that is really embedded in the budget itself. And what um, has been encumbered uh, um, towards salaries, towards supplies. And so that is part of the monitoring that happens on a day in and day out basis. Yeah, I, I want to add something here too that I think clarifies and complicates because the issue of contracts came up and we initially said we would only look at contracts over a certain amount. But as it turned out, there were a number of contracts to the same vendor that aggregated to above that certain amount. And then we saw we weren't going to be monitoring budget revision changes. But just by example, one came through to take a position that was frozen and said, well, since we can't hire that position, we'd like to hire a contractor. Well, that defeats the whole purpose of a hiring freeze. And the, the, the language is a little problematic in that freeze doesn't mean frozen forever. It means stopped for now. And we're in hiring under certain criteria. So a lot of the risk is it takes a long time for this to reach school sites, even though they may be across the street, it takes a while for that mindset to, to, to move forward. And Dr. Wayne mentioned earlier about, decent, about centralized staffing. That is, is as major a change for the district as starting to have position control. 
as you move to that, you get much more control over your hiring, who hires, how they get approved at, at every step along the way. And it's going to mitigate that risk over time. Right now, you're kind of in that place where I'm trying to think of an example that's not too gross, but you pull the Band-Aid off the wound and it still looks pretty ugly, but it's actually healing. So we're seeing things that aren't really comfortable to see, but we're getting much closer to control over hiring, to identifying where there's a need. So that risk is, I would even say, minimizing by the day, but it needs a, a commitment from every level of the organization. So. Thank you, Mr. Dushan. That's um, very helpful. I just wanted uh, for note, I mean, um, timekeeping, I want to get my colleagues, um, our colleagues here to wrap up our discussion, hopefully within 90 minutes of uh, start our meeting times so around 630. So it leaves us with about a um, little, about 40 minutes. So we have a couple more sections, four more sections. So just to be mindful, an estimated of, you know, up to 10 minutes per section, but it doesn't have to be equal time. Um, so with that, I'd like to shift to um, section ER, uh, four, the ERP systems project. I think for the most part, um, I think this area has actually been covered. We talked about it kind of in combination with um, section three. This is talking about um, the different um, budget modules that would come on procurement and also um, the payroll and financial modules coming on. Any additional questions in that area? Yes, I do. I think overall uh, we've been categorizing, you know, three generational projects moving all in the same time while it is of the essence given um, the needs of our district, but also recognizing that they are generational projects. And um, with the ERP system, um, certainly we are still recovering and healing from um, a system that um, ultimately failed um, in our the way we delivered for our staff um, and what the district overall needed. Could you talk about Dr. Huntoon right now, I, certainly, and, and Dr. Clark, um, so much of um, the ERP system project is well beyond the five lines, um, but in the spirit of the analysis right now, what are you seeing um, around um, some clear benchmarks that you're gonna have to meet and anything that's coming up that's giving you worry or pause so that we can deliver on that, um, you know, clear going live. So I think any time that you are implementing an ERP system, there is always that um, that there's something you, you worry that something is going to go wrong. Um, I do have to say with the um, implementation that's happening right now in San Francisco, I think they have a fabulous team. Um, the process that is in place, monitoring the meetings that are, are scheduled. We get a weekly we get a weekly report every Friday that indicates using green, yellow, red, um, whether we're on track or not. Um, and when we're not, and in fact, we had a call today. We we have some data that needs to get in to ensure that we're going to be able to have all of the data so we can do comparisons in frontline. So that is something that we 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 have the benchmarks, and if the benchmarks aren't met, then we know we can go to our secondary our plan B, which is you contact someone to get that data in ASAP. So um, I do think, and maybe um, Dr. Clark can speak more eloquently to this, but um, just coming, just being here two months, I am impressed by the work that's being done on the implementation, um, both by Frontline as well as with um, Dr. Clark's team that she has in here. Ms. Kathy Hopkins is amazing, um, and she's doing fabulous work. Uh, keeps us on our toes, that's good. Um, and so I, from my perspective, what I'm seeing, I'm feeling very comfortable with 
us meeting the timelines that we need to, to do both the testing ahead of time, as well as meeting our timelines and our benchmarks so that we can implement on time. I don't know if maybe Dr. Clark has wants to add something. Sure, I would agree with everything that Dr. Huntoon just shared with the uh, regular cadence of meetings, the timeline that has been uh, laid out, as well as the district's ability to move forward with all the different goals and objectives. Um, I think it's very important to also lift up the, um, the, the, the way that the district responds when we do have an issue or a challenge that we need, you know, a little bit more manpower to get a, a, over the finish line. And we've had a couple of those instances where um, we did need to lean in and lean in differently in order to meet those goals and objectives. And the district has been able to do that. Um, it, it It's really, you know, pushing a lot of individuals to work a lot of hours and extended periods of time. Uh, but if you remember, the, the goal is to, you know, have this ERP system up and running so that the district can build next year's budget in this ERP module. And we are definitely still moving in that direction. Um, as Dr. Huntoon mentioned, we did have a meeting earlier today to talk about some things and uh, discuss areas that we may need to tweak a little bit in order to hit that uh, milestone, but we are definitely moving in the right direction. Um, what will continue to be critical is the district's ability to meet those specific timelines because, um, you know, when, when we're looking at those timelines, they're there for a purpose so that we can get certain aspects of the project over the finish line. And as long as we're able to do that, we will continue to move forward with this project. The other thing that I'll add is that we are also looking at district systems and processes and procedures and questioning whether or not those are the most effective and a effective and efficient practices or processes to have in place. And when they are not, the district is making adjustments and recalibrating um, how it's doing business so that we're not just bringing in old practices that may not necessarily be industry standard. And that's critical. And I want to give um, kudos to Dr. Huntoon for continuing to lead those efforts and having those conversations and working with the team to make adjustments as needed. I'm so happy to hear that progress because I think we've talked for years now the need for understanding industry industry best practices, the need for SFUSD to be integrated to be you know amongst peers to understand the latest um, adoptions of, of standardized uh, processes and procedures, how that's being documented, how that's being um, adopted you know uh, by staff, and then it's understood as it's like quote socialized and actually. Um, adhere to. So um, I appreciate being able to hear from Dr. Clark um, around that progress and, and Dr. Hunting, your leadership. And um, certainly it's important for the board, um, this committee, as well as our full board to understand um, what does it take? Because I know that change doesn't happen um, because we have a handbook and we go, but it's really um, the behaviors that are necessary of adults so that we can improve our educational outcomes um, for our students ultimately. So I really um, appreciate hearing um, that work that's progressing. And certainly this is the committee that should there be, um, you know, uh, slower progress um, and being able to understand what is needed um, for that that forward progress to continue and its pace that's necessary so that everything is so interlocked with one another like the ERP system project that's going to be hinging on that progress. Um, so Vice, Vice President Weissman Ward. Yes, um, happy to see progress on our ERP system. Um, I have a question about 4.1 where the due date is September 30th and it says not started so that might be another maybe it's more nuanced than that but so one question about 4.1 was um, if it's not started is there concern that we're not gonna be able to meet that deadline um, given that it's the end of the month and then the I know the notes um, indicated that you were maybe looking for clarification and um, wanted to know if that's still a discussion that we should have in order for your team to be able to move forward with it. My understanding is that it comes from um, 
a previous board meeting where we looked at um, what went wrong <laughs> and, and how to not do that again. So I wanted um, to understand um, what, what's happening um, with 4.1, what progress has been made, and if there's any additional clarification that's needed. So I'm going to start out on this, and others that have more knowledge than I do from before, please chime in. Um, so it is my understanding, yes, this was a, um, from a, a prior board meeting and a discussion and, an, and a request um, because of um, the past um, activities. And um, so and and so the validation contractor would again be, you know, hiring someone from the outside to come in to ensure that we are meeting timelines for our um, Oh, I have a friend that just visited here um, that um, would come in and take a look at you know our process that we're utilizing for the implementation of uh, the ERP system that we've chosen. And so, with that, since he came right up front as a willing person, I'm going to I'm going to turn it over to um, Mr. Marin Trujillo. Good evening, um, ad hoc committee. <laughs> Is that the official? So. We, we got recommended from uh, the city and others to look into an IVNV. Uh, I think that's the, the, the uh, for those who do this ERP implementation. Um, we did not know, they're kind of expensive. Uh, one quote was for one million for one of them. So it did make pause for finding who's the right person. In my investigation for this, we found that they all wanted to expand their role from a traditional verification. This is a third party that keeps both sites honest, right? We thought, that sounds good, we want that. Um, they're more expensive than we projected. Uh, in talking to everyone, I'm gonna make a very bold statement and say that we think we're fine without it. However, if it's a strong pleasure that we bring it, uh, we will need to probably increase the budget a little bit to find the right vendor that can help us. We don't know if FICMAT could be a vendor, but I don't know, Michelle, if... Yes, I, I believe that FICMAT can give us, can provide us with names of other organizations or individuals that could come in and provide that service. Um, but I, I would agree that I think what we have in place for this ERP system, um, with everything that's documented very well, that, um, I, I don't see at this point in time that we need to move forward with this. However, if in the very near future, if there was a need for something like that, then we would come forward. And I just, I just want to acknowledge Marine Trujillo saying that. Like I'm the I'm one of the people who has been saying like we you know this was very complicated to undo what SAP and all the emphasis all that. So. Um, we were, to be very clear, we were had our own intentions of doing this, but it seems to be an expensive endeavor. I mean, $1 million for a third party to come in and advise felt unsustainable, so. Yeah, I just want to say, I appreciate you naming yourself, Marin, because while I've appreciated the analysis, I mean, I have explained to the team, and you know, Dr. Antunes coming in new, there is a credibility gap we need to address and this is why this was brought forward so we're having a real-time conversation mr dushan does, doesn't even know what i asked the team is is we still need to see like are there other you know organizations that could provide that review including we we you know mr dushan and Ms. lazan are on our cap governance team and then now what is different from when we uh shared this plan to now is we are um, you know, we have our fiscal stabilization plan and are really being tight on any additional costs. So to see if it's worthy, worth a cost. But I mean, I've been frank in saying, just our saying that we got it, I don't know if that's gonna be uh, enough. Um, we do have a lot more in place than I think from before, but, but still, I wanna just acknowledge that that's our, our current reality. Superintendent, I appreciate that recognition and uh, Vice President Weissman Ward. Thank you. Um, thanks. I guess I have a, a few questions slash just I'm going to voice a, a, a concern, which is I do think staff said that this was going to be done. And at the end of the day, we this is a decision that staff will make. 
um, and we will trust you to make the decision that is the best for the district. I think it's, um, it is useful to, when there, when there is a change of course, just to, to be informed. Um, and I, I, I think my question then would be, and, and um, Dr. Huntun, you gave a little bit of hint of this, is, is um, and this relates to <laughs> Dr. Wayne's noting of the credibility gap, is there's a cost, of course, but look at how much money we spent and lost on a system that was not properly analyzed, rolled out, all of that didn't work. And so how, what should we know and understand and what should the public know and understand to believe that it's not that this is just too much money, but actually we do have this and it's not necessary because I think for me, that's what I would want to know is why in fact is this not necessary and just a waste of money? Yeah. So, and then I'm going to say just for also just in the interest of time, I mean, I think th this is the real time update, but I think for a formal recommendation that this be removed from the dashboard or we have a change, I want us to be able to answer those, those questions that, you know, either we have um, other enough other, um, for lack of a better word, eyes on it from the city and from CD and, and or that there's not a really someone well positioned to do that to say we recommend and we have these controls in place to say we're going to formally now recommend changing course from this. But this is the current status of it and why it hasn't been um, updated yet. I just want to, I completely understand your point. Yeah, the, just to add to the conversation, it is, there are, you are owed an explanation of what, why do we think this now, right? This is a bespoken system for LEAs, for a school, public school system. The, the, it's we are moving forward. So having a third party validator to come, um, it's, the way I understand it, come in and out, not be internally. We didn't know how helpful that was going to be to do this, but um, uh, I point taken, uh, Commissioner. I waste my word. Yeah. I think your comments relate to some of what I was trying to drive to earlier. So thank you, Vice President Wiseman Ward, for the, I agree wholeheartedly, and I appreciate naming the credibility gap, Superintendent Wayne, because um, one of the issues that we've had with contracts in the past, which is part of why I was hoping that it would be named here in the dashboard, is that we haven't always had a transparent scope of work, right? We. Um, very often there's a lack of understanding of what exactly it is that we're paying for and what we're getting for our money. Um, and so hopefully a lot of this work that we're doing here with the dashboard will help us have a better understanding. So to that end specifically here, what was this million dollar scope of work and how are we covering it with SFUSD resources or other resources that we've already purchased? I think is specifically one of the things that I would love to see um, addressed if we are going to remove this item from the, um, you know, how are we mitigating these risks mm -hmm. to the point? And I'll stop there. If you don't mind, um, I think given what the district's been through with Empower, this is a very reasonable ask is to have it validated by a third party contractor. And as we look into it, there are not people that do that for educational products because the product we chose works, right? There's not a market for people to come in and tell you what's wrong with your frontline implementation. There clearly is a market for what's wrong with your SAP implementation because we've hired all those contractors, right? But so I think your question is, is well taken. It's what, how, have you, how are you accounting for this and what we've already paid for the process that we're going through now? So, I would just add that the, um, I, I think the key here is that it is a proven K-12 system and it's, and in California, which is also uh, important. That's fantastic. Um, I'm wondering, given sort of, given the, the history, given the context, um, given that we initially said this is something we were going to do. And I mean, great if it's like, this is so excellent. No one even needs to look at it. I do think Superintendent Wayne, if appropriate, um, having something, and I, I know we're having this discussion in real time, but, but maybe next steps could be having something um, in writing, a, essentially a cost benefit analysis um, and all the reasons why this is not necessary. Um, and yeah, we'll bring that forward. 
uh, for our next meeting. Yeah, my preference is not to eliminate 4.1 from the dashboard, but to note exactly that um, cost benefit analysis so that it can be documented around that, you know, um, the rationale of the decision um, from the staff and, you know, the validate or the um, Certainly, if the fiscal advisors or FICMAT Michael Fine, if they have opinions on that, to also have them weigh in on that would certainly go a long way. Um, I have not forgotten um, Michael Fine's um, presentation to the board um, and a very clear, um, I'm going to use the word scolding, but yes, um, is directive of you know the responsibility of um, this, the board and the due diligence that we must, um, you know, adhere to. Uh, so certainly it, it, what you're hearing from the board is n not about not trusting the staff and your decision, but it's really then how do we affirm to the public that the um, that cost benefit analysis and having um, this, the experts like you all um, along with the advisors weigh in is important. Okay, thank you. So Can now, I speak to the next one briefly? Um, so this is the, this is the um, resource alignment initiative, and you know this is one that's on there because I, when putting together the dashboard, like it's critical to our fiscal and operational health. Um, and so, just want to note though, I mean, we, we have had I mean, we just had a whole workshop on it last time, and we've had n um, numerous conversations about it. And so, you know, I think. I think for the purposes, I mean, so we're, we're, you know, on, on target to do, um, you know, to do this, uh, to, I mean, to move forward with this plan. I think for the purposes of this, this group and like this dashboard, I was thinking that, um, you know, when, when 5.2, when the board hears portfolio of school closures, mergers, and co-locations, we've talked a lot about how this is not a this is not going to solve our fiscal issues however you know at the same time if, if this by itself is not going to solve our fiscal issues that's how we say it but at the same time it is one of the key components to being able to address our fiscal issues and there's been a lot of questions about like well, what will the savings be and we haven't answered that question yet because we are determining what the plan is we share the plan we'll have the savings that seems to be what would be relevant to uh, you know, a conversation here. So I just wanted to note that, I mean, you know, we're, which I didn't even look at, yeah, we're, we're on schedule for these things, but maybe 5.2, um, you know, when we, maybe at the ad hoc in, in um, I think we do it at the end of October before the November, this is brought to the board, that would be the area of, of substance, I think, that would be relevant to the ad hoc committee. But the rest is kind of, you know, this one in particular, the whole board obviously needs to make a decision, and um, it, it, it's critical that the whole governance team is involved. But so I just wanted to add that. But I mean, we are, you know, on target, on, uh, you know, for our announcement on September 18th, and and uh, to bring the recommendations on the 12th, and for the board to take action on the in, in December, and then to do our transition plan. Colleagues. Um, you uh, first question, Doctor. When you mentioned um, that you're going to, we couldn't ascertain savings until we know how many and how, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what, if any, like how are you determining um, the co the costs associated? Like there's savings, but we've also heard there may be costs associated with closing closing schools. So, so what are how will you know those? And when will it be the same time that, that you have the savings? Um, yes, because, and this is uh, Commissioner Lamb asked about our transition planning. So those are one time costs we expect. Uh, but yes, to have those identified when we share the announcement of our portfolio and our, our plan. And in those three areas I named the uh, kind of facilities costs, uh, the logistics costs, and then the um, engagement costs and, and bringing families together and staff for after school meetings and things like that. Dr. Hunt, anything else that you want to add for section five? I think one thing I wanted to know 
Um, and I appreciate Superintendent Wayne, you uh, framing around the, um, you know, RAI on its own um, does have impact to the budget monitoring and planning and something that I think would be important um, as the plan is being um, announced, revealed to the board and to the community that there be clear understanding between, um, you know, as we go into the budgeting process, what, you know, we have our base um, staffing model, but also knowing that we have to have reductions of $100 million. And I think that's what I'm hearing from community that they're not necessarily understanding the kind of through line um, and just because it's, you know, understandably very complex and we're still kind of work in progress, you know, because the RAI hasn't been announced, but that's something that I, it would be important um, with the announcement of the transition plan. And then how does it at the same time start that planning process um, that we have to undergo for the 25, 26 budget? So, yeah, here, and I can give a concrete, like very clear, concrete examples. So remember earlier this evening, I, I said our 25, 26 reduction plan didn't necessarily take into account school closures. Right, and that we're going to update that plan for to bring for first interim, which gets adopted on December 10th. No, on no, we're we're bringing the school closure plan on December 10th, and first interim will actually be sorry, we're bringing the school closure plan December 10th, and first interim will be voted on on December 12th. So right now, in those 505 FTE, there are not any um, principal position reductions. Right, because for every school we have, we need a principal that's not in dispute in any form. Like this is an area where we can make reductions. However, um, for the 25-26 plan, we will now once we present our school closure plan, that reduction plan will be updated now to include principal positions. And so then, if that plan doesn't get approved, you know whatever number of principals and the savings we have from that, we would need to find now in other places. Um, to be able to maintain, you know, still deliver on the hundred plus million of reductions we need to do. So that's what, like, th that's very specifically what you'll you'll see and you'll understand the implication if we don't move forward with the closure plan. Here's other areas we're going to need to find reductions from uh, by not doing that. There's a lot of contingencies here, right? And so I think there's a lot of cascading things. So I just want to be clear that when we're talking about the financial impact, I mean, at the same time, we're also talking about redesigning our enrollment zones and things like that, too. So I guess what I'm trying to understand from a strategic level, we have the dashboard. But in order for this to be successful, there's a whole lot of things and resources that have to cascade, much of which fears into micromanagement from us as a board. But in order to approve this, we've got to know that all those parts are there and accounted for, right? So I, I guess I'm wondering about the interconnectedness of all of that, you know, the enrollment, the fiscal stabilization plan, you know, how how are things, how are these estimates being updated and uh, and how is the the kind of circular impact that's what I don't understand how that's reflected here in the dashboard and how it's reported out so uh, that's what I'm trying to wrap my brain around and there's a question there that I'm talking around and haven't quite named I don't know colleagues if you want to help but I'm not sure but th that's why I was saying a 5.2 in the plan we're bored here is proposed portfolio of closures, mergers, and co-locations that's specific to our fiscal stability. You need to understand what the implications are for that um, and if we move or do not move forward with that. And then to your point, when we present that plan, though, that we also need to understand the implications if we move, move, decide to move forward or not with that plan of what it means for our enrollment policy, right? Because we, we said we are moving towards more neighborhood-driven enrollment policy, but before we you know, identify any new attendance boundaries, we want to know what schools are in our portfolio. So they are connected, but I think specific to, and like, so that's what we talked about when we present the whole plan and what you you take action on, but specific to the fiscal piece is is where I think the savings and the trade-offs would be discussed. Uh, that'd be uh, here where we can go more in depth about that. 
I think to clarify is I, I still don't understand what we can expect in the plan. And I think a little bit of transparency to, to know if we've met this benchmark, I think I need to better understand what the expectation of the benchmark is, right? Oh, so yeah, that's okay. where I, I think, um, where here it says proposed, proposed portfolio of school closures, mergers and co-locations, what you just described goes well beyond that. And I would expect that level of detail in order to see to be marked complete rather than just naming a portfolio. So, so I think that's where I'm struggling. Yeah. If it's okay. Oh. Yeah. I think some additional information, which would be helpful now, um, but but knowing that it's you don't have the the concrete numbers now. But I think if you can answer, I'll ask a general question about. Um, estimations and then I think when it comes to us we would want those concrete numbers so if you were to based on the information you have today at 6 20 p.m would you expect closures to be a financial net negative or a positive in 2024 25 and also 25 26 and I and I understand that the that this process is not driven it's not a budgetary driven process it is about making our educational experiences better for kids but it is a, it is something that is related and so i'm just wondering if you can give us as like what is your estimate is it are we looking net positive net negative for 24 25 and then 25 26. yeah well we're in 24 25 so but we are going to have some costs to the transition right, right. no so i think net positive and one thing we want to show is also we do our projections you know we're, you're required when we adopt a budget to adopt the budget for this year plus two years out right it was one of the reasons we got the negative so we want to show, and definitely when you look at the three-year picture, it's a net net savings that's going to be critical to our financial stability. And you think net positive for this Meaning year as well? Meaning net positive uh, savings. For this year, let us do a little more math uh, because we're not really saving anything this year. We're spending spending money this right. year. But so these so are I, I do think that, I yeah. think but given will, that we are looking that we have a, some budgetary concerns. Yeah, but we will be spending one-time funds this year, mm -hmm. with, uh, but expecting to get ongoing savings in the future. So the other thing, just maybe to wrap this up, and I'm looking at, at the time, I think really what I, what I would like we can have as a next step, and this will be for the office of superintendent, is really the description of the deliverable, revise that to be more ad hoc specific. Because to, to your point, Commissioner Fisher, right now it just says you would get a list of mergers, co-locations, and closures submitted to BOE, given community feedback, equity audit, and sequence analysis. I think we could be more specific what, um, based on the conversation here of what the deliverable would be in this dashboard to the ad hoc. So if that's okay, while well, that is a next step for uh, discussion next time. Yes, and to be explicit around um, also um, illustrating that short-term one-time cost versus the year over year, which the superintendent raised. Great, okay. And be mindful of time. So uh, moving to section number six, other deficiencies. In the essence of time as well, I think we've talked a little bit around some of these issues that are listed in section six. Um, I will tell you that on the audit findings, um, audit findings for the years of 2020, 21, 22, and 22, 23. Those will be wrapped up into the Department of Ed by September 19th. Um, so those those are um, those are on their way to, and that was the time frame that uh, Department of Ed provided to us. Um, the cash flow cash flow um, is ongoing and starting this month. It will be monthly. Uh, we will we we will be watching cash flow, uh, particularly. Um, as we are a district in uh, financial um, distress. Um, I thought there was also something about our enrollment projections. En enrollment projections, yeah, looking at enrollment projections that takes into account um, enrollment for the last um, school year and utilizing three-year averages based on uh, trend analysis from the district's actual um, student enrollment. Um, different than, say, a CBEDS, because that's really at the beginning of the year as opposed to the end of the year. And so that's really what um, we'll be looking at. 
Um, and then there was one other one in here that I wanted to speak to. We talked a little bit about contract management and monitoring practices, and I think we have um, started that. Um, and so that will be something hopefully by the end of the year, uh, we will have um, some practices and policies in place that we can implement uh, around that area. So I think that's it on that, unless there are questions. I do specifically around the enrollment projections, um, mm -hmm. similar to in the a spirit of um, Vice President Weissman Ward asking when um, the status is listed is not started, just if there's new, more nuance to that. I also do want to note that over the years, certainly the enrollment projections um, and how we adjust our staff accordingly um, has been a risk. It's something that we haven't, um, we've kind of come up short as far as kind of being um, missing the mark, so to speak. And it notes here around the reviewing the methodologies um, for 25-26. So um, Dr. Huntington, can you talk a bit about, again, industry standards? What are things that you're bringing and what are some potential uh, limitations or risk um, to get this work started or and meeting um, our goal? So as I just indicated, it really is a cohort methodology utilizing a three-year averaging over um, the data, the trend data from the district itself, um, and then utilizing that, um, because that's your first step, uh, and then utilizing that um, uh, for staffing, but that is also uh, incorporated into the CBA, so making sure that we're meeting CBA language uh, for staffing levels. Um, and so that, from that perspective, the risk um, at this point, just you know, trying to get some data, um, and once that data is is um, available, then we'll be able to to take a look at that. But that is also something as we are um, moving into um, first interim in December, and also looking at the update to our fiscal stabilization plan that we need to have um, those enrollment. Uh, calculations done pretty quickly, looking at the end of September, 1st of October. I think my follow-up is that this is a kind of a thread to what Commissioner Fisher had raised earlier around um, positions um, mm -hmm. and being able to understand the number of positions that are needed. Mm -hmm. um, and so what is it that we need in order to make progress on this? So data for enrollment that's based on actuals that will then be utilized once we are, we apply that three-year averaging to determine what our needs are going to be for staffing for 25, 26, and beyond. And is there anything right now that's in, like, are we just waiting for that data enrollment? Is there anything that's inhibiting yeah. it? Okay. Yeah. Can I just ask a clarifying question? Why, mm -hmm. why are, is the data based on the last school day of the year when, frankly, our seniors are already gone, mm -hmm. right? So we're mm -hmm. missing a grade of enrollment. Mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of folks have already left for the summer. Why? Why, why is that? As a, as a K twelve district, you do have a benefit that you actually have the eighth grade enrollment um, available for you to be able to determine what you should be able to see. Um, what eighth graders? You know, how many of your eighth graders are matriculating into your high schools? Um, and so you're utilizing that information, and you have that available to you because you're within one organization, not uh, an agency that would be a high school district. It's difficult, not impossible, but difficult because you don't have that eighth grade information. But because you do have that, and you are looking at your trends, um, then you have that information available. Yes, you are correct. You're losing on the high end for your 12th grade, but you also do have your eighth grade coming in. Can I add something to that? Because we had the same conversation today because that's a practice in San Francisco that I think is not seen in other districts where the finals are given early and there's very low attendance the last week of school. Um, but Michelle clarified that she's looking at enrollment, not attendance on the last day of school. So as opposed to a CBEDS um, where it's early on in the year, and we know that there is some matriculation out throughout the year so that as you're utilizing that registered enrolled student at the end of the year, as you go into the next year. I hope that helps. I was reading that as ADA, so that's helpful. Thank you. Colleagues, any other questions? monitoring.
Okay, so it's 6.30 now, so I want to move into our um, final section around the parking lot scope and target dates. Uh, anything that, Dr. Hunting, that you would like to add? I do not. Commissioner Fisher, did you have a clarifying question? Yeah, the, um, the one thing we've talked about, but I don't see any where and where we're monitoring it is strategic abandonment, how we're planning to obsolete certain, you know, as part of, maybe that's part of the contract overview portion that was in the section we just, but how, how are we monitoring the obsolescence work that we've got to do in order to make sure that we're, we're doing the work we need to do? Um, just not seeing that reflected in the dashboard, but maybe I'm not looking in, maybe I'm, again, maybe it's wordsmithing. No, I, mean, I think that might be a good one for follow-up. Unless you have something you want to, want to share. I, the one thing that I was going to mention, you know, as we look at contracts in <clears throat> throughout the district in different disciplines, you're also assessing, is it, does this still meet our purpose? Um, is it still valid? Um, so that that is a process that we're going through in all of those discipline areas that I mentioned. Anything else? Colleagues, um, I want to appreciate um, your engagement and really appreciate um, Dr. Huntoon and, and the team here um, to Ms. Air um, and the superintendent. I think that this is, now we're starting to get into the rhythm of um, expectations um, of what we will discuss at this committee. I think really being able to glean out, you know, when we're making progress and when there are risks so that it's not a surprise um, once it gets to the full board. So um, thank you again so much for the uh, kind of lightning bolt rounds um, and appreciate um, the the work and I will adjourn our meeting at 6.32. Thank you.